Good evening, everybody. Welcome. I'm Jennifer LaRue, and on behalf of the Mark Twain House and Museum, I'm delighted to welcome you all to what I know is going to be a fascinating evening, a great conversation. Uh, I've just had an opportunity to spend some time with uh, Maude and Alexander in the green room, and I think you're really going to enjoy what they have to say to and with one another. So I'm going to get um, to that as quickly as I can. I do have a little bit of housekeeping to do before I introduce our, our guests tonight. Um, first of all, I love seeing you all chatting away in the chat. Please continue to do that throughout the program. That's one of the great benefits of the virtual setting uh, that doesn't extend to the in-person setting. You can't sit there in an auditorium and chat, but you sure can here. So please do chime in. Let us know where you are viewing from. Um, anything else you want to chat about, go ahead and do it there. Uh, know that this program is being recorded and will be posted on uh, the Mark Twain House website, or you can simply uh, come back to the link that you used to get here this evening and watch it again anytime you like. And one of the cool things is that the chat remains live. Uh, so even it, the, the, the program is recorded. If you make a friend or start a conversation here in the chat and you want to come back and continue that conversation, you can do that anytime you like. However, toward the end of our program, we're going to have audience questions. And if you could do me the great favor of posting your questions in that area that you see at the middle of the bottom of the screen that says, ask a question, rather than posting it in the chat, that'll make it a lot easier for me to keep track of when I come back on screen to help with that part. Um, also, you can take a look at the questions other people have asked. And if you have the same one, you can click on it to upvote it. And that moves it closer to the top of the pile. So that's uh, part of the fun too. While you're looking at that part of the screen, I ask you just to raise your gaze a tiny bit uh, to that long green bar that says your support is vital. You know, the Mark Twain House and Museum uh, got out ahead of the curve pretty quickly when the COVID pandemic began and started offering these virtual programs way back in April 2020 and offered something, I, I don't know, hundreds of them since then, sometimes three or four a week. And um, it's been a wonderful way to stay connected with uh, our communities and audiences all over the world. But while the museum has rarely, rarely charged a registration fee for any of these uh, virtual programs, know that they're not free for the museum to mount. So that um, I just bring that up by way of saying, if you have enjoyed the programs, if you enjoy tonight's program, uh, if you are able to and so inclined, know that anything you're able to donate by clicking that button um, in the way of supporting the virtual programs is very deeply appreciated by the staff and the board of trustees of the museum and it's put to very, very good use. Um, having worked there, I, I know that um, every, every penny is put to good use. Now, at the very top of your chat, and we will repost it uh, quickly so that it is more visible, there's a link by which you can purchase your very own signed copy of the book we're talking about tonight, Ancestor Trouble by Maud Newton. Um, now, we're no dummies. We know that you can purchase a copy of this book elsewhere. But do know that if you uh, do, if you're buying by uh, clicking that link. Oh, thank you, Alice, for sticking that back up. Um, you, number one, you get a signed copy, which is not the case everywhere. And also, your purchase does benefit the Mark Twain House and Museum. So please bear that in mind uh, as we move through the program. Okay. It's time for me to thank our sponsors, first of all. Uh, tonight's program, like all of our virtual programs, is sponsored by the Wish You Well Foundation and by Connecticut Public, WNPR. It's produced in part with support honoring the legacy of Frank Lord, who was a much beloved trustee of the museum who passed away last year. And the museum is delighted to honor his memory uh, through these virtual programs. If you want to learn about upcoming programs, please visit marktwainhouse.org. Uh, not just virtual programs, but the museum is starting to offer uh, live in-person events again. Um, and so if you're in the greater Hartford area and are able to take advantage of that, you'll see plenty to choose from there. Now I'd like to introduce our guests. Our moderator tonight is Alexander Chi. Uh, he's a wonderful person. He's spoken with us before. Um, he's the best-selling author of the novels Edinburgh and The Queen of the Night, and the essay collection How to Write an Excuse me, How to Write an Autobiographical Novel. And um, he asked me to keep his introduction to that, so I'm going to stop there. But uh, do know that there's a lot more that I could say about Alexander. 
Maud Newton is a new guest um, for us. She's written personal essays, cultural criticism, and fiction. Her essay on America's ancestry craze, the seed of the book we're talking about tonight, was a Harper's cover, cover story. And both the book and the essay are outgrowths of an old weekend ancestry posts on her blog. Maude has written personal essays, and I've already told you that, you know what, I'm going to just introduce the two of them by bringing them on screen. And again, there's so much to say about both of them. So please, everybody, join me in welcoming Maude Newton and Alexander Chi to the screen. And give us just a moment to bring everybody fully up. Maude and Alexander, thank you so much for being here this evening. It's yeah. my pleasure. Yes. So uh, Alexander, will you let me know when it's time to um, do audience Q&A and I'll come back on screen and help with that? Absolutely. All right then, I'm gonna sit back and enjoy with everybody else. Uh, thank you so much. And I will see you in a few minutes. Thank you, Jennifer. So Maude and I spoke a little bit uh, in advance and uh, with our uh, our host and uh, decided on something, a format that, uh, that I call Berlin style, um, which means that I learned it in Berlin. It sounds sexier than it is, but basically uh, in Berlin, it's very common for the interviewer and the subject to speak for a little bit. And then there's a short reading and then we speak some more and then we bring you in for questions. So that's what's going to happen. Um, uh, Maude, this moment is a long time in the making. You have been trying to write about this material for over a decade. Is that right? Yes. So first of all, thank you for doing this. I could not be more excited to be talking with you. Um, one of my most beloved people and most cherished muses, as you know. Um, but yes, so I have been writing about my family, um, you know, as long as I could write, basically. And, um, you know, I wrote about them on my blog, and it was around 20, uh, 2007 that I started sort of posting about my genealogical finds, my grandfather who was said to have married 13 times, my great grandfather who was said to have killed a man with a hay hook. Um, and at the time I was like, oh, you know, I keep wasting time on this genealogy stuff instead of, you know, working on the important work of my novel, you know, my serious project. Um, yeah, but I kept, you know, spending time in all these different spots, you know, Ancestry.com, 23andMe, and um, posting about it. And so eventually the editor of Harper's, uh, Chris Beha, asked me if I wanted to write an essay. I said yes, but I still didn't really anticipate writing a book at that point. I think it's very interesting to me that part of you uh, had the impulse to write a novel about the same kinds of events. It's partly the draw of what in the book you call the kind of colorful stories of the family, right? Yeah, I, um, I probably did use that word. I don't remember using it, but that's Sorry, <laughs> Sorry if I missed it. <laughs> no, I, I probably did. It might um, be a reviewer. It might be a reviewer. It okay. might be. Um, but yeah, I mean, so it is interesting that I was trying to mine this for fiction um, and create something out of it that was fictional. Um, and, you know, I think it's for the best for everyone that I got this out of my system in this way <laughs> instead of in fiction. But, um, you know, yeah, I was really drawn to the sort of like the grandfather, the 13 marriages, you know, another great grandfather of mine, all of these people I've mentioned so far were on my mom's side. Um, so the great grandfather who was said to have been a um, communist in early 20th century Texas, that was kind of what got me started looking up these, these people who were part of my mom's and my grandmother's tall tales, you know, that mostly turned out to be true. Um, 
And yeah, then on the other side, there was my father's family, which, um, you know, my father was a super, as you know, um, very overbearing person, um, difficult parent to have. And a huge part of that difficulty was that he was a really overt white supremacist. So I knew from a young age because he defended, I mean, he exalted our ancestors who had enslaved people, black people. I knew, um, you know, that I had that history in my family and I was always really drawn to reckoning with it in some way. Um, so, but that was definitely like, a, you know, a more fraught, part of the research for me. Um, when I started digging into that, I, um, you know, I, it, it was as intense and terrible as I expected and more. I think part of what I found really fascinating about the book is the way in which you, you describe these tall tales, which do seem, it's a rogues gallery, you know, like, <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, some of them are angels, not all of them are rogues, but uh, only a few. And I think the the thing that I found most uh, moved by is that you made a decision to avoid making it about that kind of personal spectacle that it could have been. And instead you were like, how is this systemic? How does this emerge from something that doesn't otherwise seem to be connected. How can I provide a context, really? And I think that's part of, uh, you know, if I may observe this, I don't know if it's true, but I think it's part of why you were even looking to try to write fiction about it. Is that perhaps true? Like, oh, how can I provide a context for this? Yeah, there was a definite sort of didactic aim of the fiction that instead I channeled into this book, which is, again, really for the best for everyone. Um, but yeah, I, I have always been interested um, in, I didn't know the, the phrase systemic racism, um, but, you know, as I write in the book, I... You know, one of the, the strange gifts of having a white supremacist father is that I did not have the luxury that some people whose families come from this history have of just sort of ignoring it or choosing not to think about it or not to reckon with it. Um, I always knew that it was there. And so I had to have a relationship to it. Um, and I you know, I would try to talk about it over the years, you know, and I found that, um, you know, especially, you know, I would try to talk about it with white friends and they would sort of act like, why are you like, what's wrong with you that you're bringing this up? And I always felt like, you know, 150 years ago, a little more than that, my ancestors were enslaving people. And that's, not really something that I can just sort of move through life without thinking about. Um, you know, and at times I felt, you know, people would sort of act like there was something wrong with me. And I was kind of like, oh, maybe there is. <laughs> but then I was also like, or maybe something's wrong with you, you know? And so in those moments, I would feel really smug, actually. Um, <laughs> and I would sort of think like, oh, well, I'm, you know, I'm looking at these histories and, you know, I'm thinking about them and, and, you know, sort of trying to find some way toward reckoning with them, even if I didn't have any idea what that might look like. Um, and then as I write in the book, I discovered that I had ancestors who enslaved people on my mother's side too. So I, in that recognition, I understood that I had divided my family into the racist side and the not racist side or the, well, maybe not fundamentally racist side, which I think is a very common thing, you know, for, for white people, frankly, that, you know, we love our, our family and 
Sorry about that. Not sure what's going on with my internet connection, but um, yeah. So we love our family, um, and so we don't. We want to disavow this this part of the history, and mm. so you know that was a really um, a humbling moment, and also it felt really important because I realized, oh, I don't, I don't want to get away from this. There's no, there's no part of my family that's not connected to this history. Um, so yeah, it's a long answer to your question, I think. Well, you know, and I think there's two things there that I would love to sort of underline or tease out. Uh, one is the danger of what, uh, you reckoning with the danger of what uh, James Allen McPherson, Jim McPherson used to call, um, uh, becoming a moral dandy, you know, where you're sort of uh, like parading your virtue in some way, um, something that it's a term I think about all the time now, actually. Um, and uh, and then the other part I think is, is that um, this really is an important book for the way that it is describing the way these kinds of uh, racist uh, white family members talk to you in very honest ways. Um, and uh, and the bluntness of that, what you were talking about, like how you couldn't hide from it, might seem even like a, an understatement once once you get inside the book. Um, and having said that, will you, will you read a little excerpt for sure. us? Sure, yeah. So this is the way that the book begins. And um, as Alex knows, the book really moves back and forth between the personal the book really moves back and forth between the personal and more general um, material. And um, so you're, you're gonna get a taste of the personal rather than the general. This is from the introduction again. I look like my father, move like my father, talk like my father. When I was a child and we went places together, we were a full size and miniature version of the same wind up toy. Our strides clipped and jolting, brows clenched in concentration, pale legs eerily glowing in brilliant Miami sunlight. I'm unmistakably my father's daughter, but we're estranged from each other. The last time I saw him more than a decade ago at my grandfather's funeral, he gave me a kiss. I don't expect he'll kiss me again. 1,300 miles from me, still down in South Florida, my father is going about his day and I can imagine it. He wakes before dawn, weighs himself, goes for a walk or a jog or rides his stationary bike. He eats breakfast if the scale permits, and then he puts on a suit and drives to his law office. If he's angry about something, and he usually is, upon arriving at work, he'll pick up the phone and call around until he finds someone with the power to rectify the problem. Let's hope they fix it right away. Otherwise, maybe tomorrow morning, but probably this afternoon, and quite possibly this very hour, he will ring them up again and start shouting. Eventually, they will do whatever my father wants, just to be free of him. I sympathize. I have loved my father and I have feared him and I have lain awake in the light in the dark late at night worrying what it means to have half his genome inside me, but I have never understood him. Sometimes I have felt that if I could just reach down far enough into myself, I would find the answers, what he wants, what he fears, what he loves. The older I get, the more I search backward, as though if I could know everyone who led to my father, who made him who he is, I would know him too. He always stressed to me the importance of blood, being worthy of it, showing loyalty to it, protecting what he called the purity of it. He was by many metrics an intelligent man. He had a master's in aerospace engineering on scholarship from an Ivy League university 
and was valedictorian of his law school class. But he considered slavery a benevolent institution that should never have been disbanded, and he viewed his and my fair skin as a mark of superiority. The world being what it was in my post-civil rights era youth, while my sister and I were growing up in 1970s Miami, my father didn't air his prejudices in public, but in private mandated separatism. Birds of a feather flock together, he was fond of saying. He said it at the breakfast table. He said it on the way to the pool. He said it at he said it while covering the faces of brown children in our storybooks with our mom's nail polish. Sometimes he closed the pages before the paint dried so that they stuck together forever, leaving nursery rhymes unrhyming and stories filled with gaps. Once he led us onto the side porch to watch as he bashed a dark skinned toy with a hammer until its head came off. I remember being eight or nine, traipsing with him around some dismal family parcel in the Mississippi Delta. My younger sister trailed behind and chill February rain drizzled down on us all as our father instructed us to pick wet cotton bowls from dead branches to fill a burlap sack he found by the side of a barn. Leading us across the acres, he stopped at some vantage point over a creek or a gully. Our forebears, Confederate soldiers, were killed on or near that very land, I seem to recall his saying. Mostly, I remember wanting to go home to my mom in Miami. She had opted out of this trip as she opted out of all family vacations toward the end of my parents' marriage, and I consoled myself by imagining her contempt. <laughs> A little, a little light reading, um, yeah, for everyone. <laughs> um, uh, it's so, it's such a distilled book mod. It really is just elegantly composed sentence by sentence. Um, what, what were some of the uh, approaches that you made to? uh to the pros in particular like did you think about it much as you were writing or was it something that you carved out closer to the end or so the personal stuff um like that so that part actually i had started the book with my mom um and my editor said no start the book with your dad uh which was a surprise because when i tried to write about my father in fiction, people always found him improbable and repellent. Uh, but yeah, so it, I actually wrote that that pretty quickly. And there were some sections that were like that, that would just come really quickly. And then there were sections where it was like, oh God, like am I ever going to get this to sort of convey what I'm, you know, what I want to convey, or am I even going to ever figure out exactly what I want to convey? Um, and uh, then there was also the, the issue of, you know, moving back and forth between the personal parts and the really deep research I did. And the, the research sort of you know, I, I delved into genetics, I delved into delved into epigenetics, I write a lot about the um, genealogy sites and the very significant issues with those. I, you know, I delved into, um, you know, Jung and his ideas about ancestors. And then I delved into um, sort of histories of spiritual practices around ancestors in the West. So it was, you know, I knew I wanted to take the book through all of that, but finding the right tone to sort of blend it all was, that was really tough. You know, there were definitely times when I was reading Aristotle at, you know, two o'clock in the morning in, in this very room. And I was like, am I writing a book or am I just like, actually doing something crazy right now so yeah <laughs> did you so I, I i want to provide for the audience a, a tiny bit of context which 
appears a little bit further into the book than we got. Um, uh, which is about um, the discovery that you were uh, a genetic project of a kind, that your father was trying to create like uh, purebred white children. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, you know, when I was a pretty young child, I asked my mother who, you know, I feel kind of bad for her because, you know, in this, because she's such a like larger than life, you know, fun person, obviously, like she also, there's a lot about her, you know, and traumatic things around her that also happened. But yeah, so I asked my mom, you know, when I was three or four, you know, how, how did you decide to marry him? Um, and, you know, she said it wasn't for love, but that they thought they would have smart children together. Um, which, you know, on the one hand, kind of, you know, I had trouble loving my father in a normal way. So, you know, it, it raised a lot of questions, but it was also a sort of confirmation of something. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think maybe also sort of knowing that I was a eugenics project, essentially, um, and ultimately like a, a failed one in my father's mind, um, that's, that's a heavy thing, you know? And I, and I do think that that, you know, on top of his extreme behavior is part of what led me to this project, for sure. Were there, I mean, it feels like a book where you maybe had to invent the genre for it, but, or was there a book or two that, that helped you, where you thought, yes, this is the kind of thing that I want to do? There, there weren't really um, any that I could find that, you know, that were doing exactly what I wanted to do. Uh, and I also, I was afraid, you know, like, for example, people recommended one of Eula Biss's books to me that I hadn't read, and I I wanted to read it, but I also, you know, I, it's fine to steal from things unconsciously, but I was like, I don't, I don't want to steal from this while I'm in the process of writing my book. Um, but I also am just like a pretty self-directed person. So, you know, I'm, I've am i always been someone who just sort of comes up with a plan. Um, it has to change, you know, it has to like, what I envisioned was not exactly the book that I ended up writing, although it was close. Um, but yeah, so I just kind of, I think of my friend Lizzie Skernick, who you also know, she talks about people's inevitable inevitability, um, you know, which is, <laughs> which is sort of her way of describing someone who's really kind of stubborn in a way that's just intrinsic to them. And I feel like this project was that for me. I was just going to figure out how to do it, you know? Yeah. Uh, yes, I think uh, there's the expression, uh, character is destiny, which is often trotted out as a polite way of saying like, well, they were always going to do that. You know? <laughs> right. Yeah, I mean, as you know, I say in the book, like, my parents knew from a really young age, when I, I mean, when I was very young, that I wanted to write, you know, and they chose to behave as they did anyway. And, you know, at this... In front of you. <laughs> right, right. I, and to me, you know, and I mean, I... At this stage in my life, I'm very happy to say that no part of this book was written as an axe grinding exercise at all. You know, in fact, if there were a way to write the book without, you know, implicating others, I would have. But that that's kind of the whole point of the project, implicating myself, implicating my larger family, and then sort of on the more positive side of it, you know, figuring out what I can take from these people that's positive um, so I can show up better, you know, in my own life so that I, um, 
I have more clarity around who I want to be and what I want to do. And I spend less of my time, you know, in this like anxiety of influence kind of mode. Mm. Was there, um, so I'm remembering that, uh, something I wanted to bring up, which is that we met through the Granta father's issue. We did, yes. <laughs> It seems very portentous for this book, and I wonder if it if that piece was like an early piece of writing that contributed to this journey. I think so. Um, yeah, and um, yeah. So, so that was definitely one of the first times that I I that was a very short piece that I wrote. Um, I think it was, sorry, I no, think it was about 300 words. Um, and yeah. And I, was it that short? I, it was very, very short. Uh, maybe it was 400. Um, but I remember that John Freeman, who invited me to write it, um, as you remember, he was editing mm -hmm. Granta at the time, Granta at the time. Um, he, yeah, he had set a number, and so I always liked to try to hit the number exactly back then. So I sent it to him, and I apologized for, like, an extra two words. Um, so, yeah, that was, um, yeah, that was definitely a, an early uh, thing. But, you know, what I think about in relation to uh, you and this book is that you and I read many years ago, um, you know, almost exactly 10 years ago, uh, we read at the KGB bar in Manhattan and, um, oh, and I would like to acknowledge that I'm on Lena Payland, um, right now in Queens in New York city. But, um, yeah, so we, um, we met at the KGB bar and I read an essay that I had been working on on and off for years about this great grandfather who was said to have killed a man with a hay hook. And I pulled together finally an early draft of that essay for that reading. Um, and at the time, as you have pointed out, you were pretty certain that I would end up writing a book about this. Um, and I, I Did was, I say that back then to you? I, I think you didn't say that directly, but you, you implied that you know there might be a book in it sometime you know or so something along those lines and yeah so um so yeah but that was such a special night and then it turned into the first chapter of the book and the thing about that um great grandfather is that you know i had this picture of him you know as this like swashbuckling hothead um and i you know thought that he was, um, you know, I imagined him getting into a fight in a bar when he was drunk. And in fact, um, he killed the man by accident. It was probably a friend of his. It was definitely a neighbor. The friend had been imprisoned because of my great grandfather Charlie's testimony. Um, he had been convicted of trying to rape his stepdaughter. And when I found that out, um, it was really, you know, I, I was really ashamed that I had sort of turned him into this cartoon in my mind. Um, and it was particularly resonant for me because I was molested. I, I write about this briefly in the book, um, you know, when, when I was a teenager. And so this sort of like notion that I had you know, used this person as a figure of fun when whatever he had said in the trial, um, you know, led to this this guy facing some consequences for his actions. Um, you know, that that was a really, it was a really humbling moment. I think that's the right word for it. Yeah. Mm. It's, it's one of the most powerful sections of the book, although it's hard to pick because because um, you really, you've really done a stupendous job writing this book. Um, Thank 
I do feel like that piece really, it stands alone. Um, whereas a lot of the other parts of the book, it's, it's very interconnected. Um, mm. whereas that, you know, that's just a story in and of itself, his story. Yeah. Uh, we're going to get to some questions shortly, but I have, uh, I have one more question I wanted to ask you before we turn to that, which is, um, what do you, so obviously you knew you would have to do some research once you got into this. Were there any ways that you worked on upping your research game for this? Or, or like what kind of skills did you bring coming into it? Because a lot of people don't know uh, much about your background uh, in addition right. to the other kind, like in addition to the blogging, the other kinds of writing that you do. So I wonder if you wanted to. Yeah, so I, um, I went to law school once upon a time and my other job uh, during the day is writing about tax law. So, you know, that I think uh, bespeaks my sort of ability to really like delve, delve, delve into really arcane uh, material. And I really take pride in my job in describing things in like a simple and straightforward way. And so far as you can, um, uh, you know, as a tax writer. Uh, but yeah, I, it's interesting because I, I really used to associate my writing with my mom. Um, and I do think there's a lot of my mom's sort of spirit, like freewheeling kind of, you know, hopefully occasionally it's broken up by a little levity. Um, you know, even if it's a kind of Texan, like I'm just kind of sliding it in there sort of thing. Um, but yeah, when I think about the book and what it took to write it, I think about my father who is also a lawyer who was always working, always researching, always crossing things out, had like papers all over the floor of his study. And so I think the skills that I needed to do the research um, are to some degree inherent, to some degree, you know, developed from being an English major and then going to law school and then sort of blogging over the years and writing criticism. Um, but each individual part of it, you know, people sometimes ask, like, which was the hardest part to write? And I think it was our mutual friend, Layla Lalami, who says, like, whichever part I'm working on at the time. Um, but, you know, for me, it was like each part demanded, like, new and terrible sort of immersion into some topic that I wasn't familiar with. And so I had to sort of wrap my mind around it, you know, really get it, get a handle on this complex research as much as I could, and then figure out how to convey it, hopefully, in a way that sort of, you know, goes along with the tone of the of the more casual personal stuff. So it wasn't like, here's a family story. And now I'm a sociologist. Um, you know. <laughs> Kablam. Um, yeah, I, uh, but it, I think the thing that you do emerge with is this portrait of uh, these family members that is also a mirror of this country and this country's past and present um, that is really powerful. Um, Thank you. And I do want to say, as you know, something that's really important to me, something you know, if I had an agenda in writing this book other than really, you know, it surprised me to find that I was writing in a spirit of service to some degree, because when I was younger, that was not my motivation. But I really, you know, I, I wrote it partly for other people who are really wrestling with these kinds of issues. Um, but the, the didactic aim of the book is you know, to in, to encourage other people who come from these histories to make it personal, to get brave and 
get out there and you know if somebody's saying oh i don't believe in systemic racism and whatever and you know <laughs> say hey you know you know 400 years ago my ancestor um killed indigenous people and cheated them out of their land you know or 150 years ago my ancestors were enslaving people and here's how i feel about that you know um i'm not saying that everyone is going to be receptive but i believe that personal stories are are much more powerful than lecturing someone i think uh yeah i think that's there's that piece, and then there's also right the um, uh, it's just opening up the rather than trying to I, well I'll put it a different way like so one of my most popular essays for example is one where I talk about uh, always getting asked at at Q and A's like about writing about the other you know usually by white writers usually asking if they can write fiction from some other point of view other than their own. And I think something that I really appreciate about this book in the context of that atmosphere is that you you showed how much there is still to say from the point of view of whiteness to the conversation on racism, which is like, okay, let's start uh, owning up. <laughs> let's start yeah. talking about the conversations that we don't have in mixed company. Let's start, you know, Telling the truth about this. Yeah, and I have found that it really, it, you know, is it the most fun thing in the world? You know, no, but it unclenching around this, sharing it is just really freeing, honestly. Um, you know, and it it enables me to sort of have an identity that acknowledges that, and it, you know. Um, and I come from that, but also an identity that's not sort of tangled up with it in the same way that it is when there's silence. And I, and I believe that that's really, that's really a sort of like selfishly positive thing that I have gained from, from being straightforward about this. You know, not to say that, I mean, I believe we have to advocate for reparations. We, you know, there are serious systemic problems that we need to look at as a society. We need to change things. However, starting with these personal stories is one of the most powerful ways we can do that. I really believe that. All right, Maude, we are going to go to the audience questions. We have uh, a number of them here. We do, and we've got some really awesome um, uh, questions from the audience. I just want to say before we move on to that part, though, that this has been one of those especially rewarding uh, conversations. And I, I think I was mentioning in the green room that I've overseen hundreds of these crowdcast conversations. And this is one of those wonderful ones where there are so many levels on which it is awesome, where the subject matter is fascinating. The chemistry between the two of you as friends is, is lovely. And then to hear two writers talking about writing and decisions that you've made as writers is just really um, something uh, to be great to, to be privy to. So thank you for sharing so much of all of those things with us. Um, and I'm just going to... If I may interject for one moment, I just want to say that I am historically a huge Twain fan. Um, okay. despite, despite, you know, I have a lot of problems with Twain. I almost view Twain as family. You know, some of the problems, problematic things that he said, offensive things that he said, but his writing um you know at a, at a sentence level and a spirit level is just you know so it was it was really bringing together alex and then you know with me and and that is always such a joy um and then you know to do it in this context feels to me really meaningful so thank you I'm so glad you shared that with us. Thank you. And have you, I, I often ask this at the very end of our program, but so you're, you're just down in Queens. Have you been to the Mark Twain house? Have I you have. Visited? I okay. have been to the Mark Twain house. I have been to his grave. Um, wow. Yeah. So I am, I am a Mark Twain 
fan with significant reservations, but yeah, right. Love. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Well, we, great, great love. Yeah. So. Whoops. And uh, yes, we, we, we embrace him warts and all um, and, and, and celebrate his warts sometimes too. But thank you for sharing that. Um, I have a million questions on my own, but this is not about me and my questions. So audience uh, questions coming up. Um, you seem to have struck a little bit of a nerve, mod when you mentioned um, some issues with the genealogy sites. Um, Liberty posed the question and four people have upvoted it. Would you be able to elaborate on some of the things that you discovered? Yes. So first of all, um, there are very, very significant privacy issues around around those websites. Um, you know, to, so 23andMe is explicitly a medical research website. That is their reason for existing. The genealogical aspects were a surprise to the company and it's a draw for them, but that is not why the site exists. So, you know, you're putting your information in there. I should also step back and say, I've done it multiple times mm -hmm. on multiple sites. I continue to be seduced by it. Um, I check in all the time, but it's a terrible idea. Um, you know, <laughs> privacy concerns are really significant. We don't know what they're gonna do uh, with that information. And, you know, as we know, humans are not very good at nuance. Um, you know, we, we find what we think is some discovery about genetics and we run with it and then we discover, oh, actually, you know, that was overstated. And, you know, I mean, the racist implications of this kind of stuff, um, you know, I mean, eugenics really kind of started in this country not in Nazi Germany. So, um, you know, I, I don't really, sorry, I don't really get into that in the book, but, you know, yeah. So, but I do get into in great detail. Some reviewers have found it maybe a little too much detail. Um, all of the problems with, with the, or an overview of the problems with these websites. Yeah. Um, but they, you know, at the same time, they're a very powerful tool for people who are adopted, who have been cut off from their roots because of the Holocaust, potentially because of slavery. Um, you know, I know for some people that's a meaningful discovery to, to find their ancestors in that way if they are descendants of people who were enslaved. Um, and there's an argument that that would be helpful with reparations. Uh, but there is also, you know, a very strong argument that, you know, these sites are, are very dangerous and we don't know um, where, how this information will ultimately be used. And one more thing I'll add on that. Um, there is um, a, a um, company that started as a project out of the University of Pennsylvania, but there's a company that... Um, uh tries to create mug shots from dna so you know if dna is left at a crime scene they, they try to use the dna to, to create a mug shot and the mug shots are really not a representation of what the person looks like but they're you know they're used um sometimes in criminal investigations wow so, yeah wow that's disturbing not as, not as in the book, but it's you know it's definitely in one of the parts where it gets in, a little into the weeds of this stuff. Well, we could talk about this all night, and maybe we'll have to have you both of you come back and and just talk about that for a program because I think people would be very interested in that. But we do have some other questions. Um, uh, Mirelle, I hope you're saying I'm saying your name correctly. Uh, says thank you both. Could you talk? a little bit more about finding the right tone, how much moral outrage to include, whether to let the details stand alone, imagining the audience for this narrative. So I, th I think we'll go with you, Maude, first, but, uh, but Alexander, you might have some things to say about this as well. Definitely, I would love to, to hear what Alex has to say as well. Um, I didn't really find it necessary to, um, impose indignation 
on the material. Um, I think just for me, though I do feel, you know, disgusted and outraged, um, you know, at my ancestors' behavior, you know, the people who enslaved people and committed genocide against Native people and the other things I've discovered. Um, yeah, I found that I just really had to write it through the lens of myself. So, you know, and my, you know, keeping it really personal in the book. Um, you know, I mean, there are places where I talk about the broader sort of so social and cultural implications and I offer opinions and, and all of that, but in the personal parts, um, yeah, I was just trying to really be as true to myself and my, you know, reactions to the discoveries as possible. And I found that, you know, the, the bewilderment and indignation sort of came naturally through that. Mm. And Alex, I'm going to hand that to you. <laughs> oh, I um I think uh sometimes there is material that just has just the act of describing it it has such a powerful voice on its own that you don't really have to do anything to that. Um recognizing that is difficult. Usually that comes with the help of an editor or uh, a trusted reader. Um but I, I do think, you know, of, you know, learning to recognize those moments. Uh, you know, I'm thinking of uh, a friend of mine who comes from uh, a white Southern family, uh, a landowning family, uh, whose dad used to always say to her, uh, I raised you like a thoroughbred which is like one of those details where like, what else can you do with that? <laughs> you have to do is have him saying that to her and, and like, you know, the, I mean, yes, there's other, you want to build the context. You want to do all these other things when you're working on a piece of writing, but those are the kinds of things that you, you learn, I think with experience to just let, uh, let the hammer as it were land and, and resonate and then you and then you move on so it's really it really is a way of listening to the material um as well as your own voice in relationship to it thank you both um no, that was awesome uh wendy lucas in our audience uh asks and a number of other people have asked uh, to have this be top of the pile were there other books that influenced your thinking as you wrote your book Oh, where to begin? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I write um, about a lot of people's stories in my book. I write about um, one of Alex's essays. Uh, Alex is one of my favorite writers, I probably should have said, in addition to being my friend. And so um, his writing is something that I really return to again and again, especially um, you know, I may not reread it, but sort of in my mind and in my heart, I'm thinking about like how to write an autobiographical novel and, and what he wrote about there. Um, my own copy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, Morgan Jerkins is someone, I mean, there's so many people. Maza Mengiste, another mutual friend of ours, um, wrote this gorgeous novel about... Um, about women banding together in a sort of as a like army um in resistance to the italian occupation of ethiopia and she finished the book and then she discovered that her great grandmother had done some of the exact things that she writes about that she oh she, wow you know were fiction and the, and the um novelist naomi alderman writes about, you know, she wrote this whole book called The Liar's Gospel, um, and it's a critical um, sort of 
fiction about Jesus and, and the disciples. And she discovered that her great grandfather had, she said, made him a question mark in the same part of Josephus uh, that caused her to, to write this book. And so I'm just, I'm really fascinated by other people's stories. I've always been. Um, and so that, that really played in. And then, I mean, you can see behind me probably some of my research and stuff. I mean, I did so much research into all these different areas. We didn't really talk about the spiritual piece because, you know, we have limited time, but you know, that, and, and, you know, there's some gene books over here in the, in the image and, you know, the, the more like spiritual ones are kind of like over here. And so it was a lot, a lot of different books that I was constantly delving into. Thank you. And yeah. uh, yeah, oh, I'll say, go ahead. Is there a bibliography mod in the back of your book? I should have checked. There are copious footnotes. Okay. <laughs> yes, there are very, very, it is the kind of footnotes that you would expect from someone who has written about tax law for more than two decades. <laughs> um, hopefully they're a little more entertaining than that, but yeah. Um, and Alexander, thank you for um, adding into the chat. Maz's novel is The Shadow King. That, that was helpful. Thank you. Um, uh, just a couple more if we have time. Uh, Barbara Ann Kearney uh, says, you mentioned researching. She says epigenetics. I'm not sure I heard that word. I think I heard eugenics. But um, what insights did you glean from this as it applies to your personal history or personal growth? Yeah, so I think a lot of us are really interested in epigenetics right now, which is, um, you know, to sort of put it in my layperson terms, it's the way it's changes in the expression of our genes. So this happens with all of us over the course of our lives. It's not a DNA thing, but our RNA can change um, in its expression. Other things can change and it can be related to trauma. Um, it can be related to other things. So, you know, a lot of us are in our culture, we're preoccupied with the idea of intergenerational trauma. Um, and that's something that interests me. That's the idea that our epigenetic changes can be passed down to our descendants and that our ancestors' epigenetic changes were passed down to us. And so I really wanted to delve into the hard science in so far as I could as a lay person. And so, you know, a lot of hard scientists really doubt that this occurs in humans, um, you know, but it definitely occurs, for example, in earthworms. And there's pretty good evidence that it occurs in, in mice. And also our science is only as good as, um, you know, the questions that we ask. So. Um, so I looked at the sort of science and then I really went into, um, my own kind of thinking around it and some of my own reading and my own experiences that, that have that kind of strange echoing, um, tone, you know, for me. Uh, so yeah, I, I definitely write a lot about epigenetics in the book. Boy, Barbara Ann, thank you for that great question um, and all the audience members for your good questions. I think we'll take one more, if that's okay, from Mariah, uh, who wants to know, what was your primary catalyst to write the book? Was it the response to the piece in Harper's or was there something else that happened to get you to dive all the way under? Thanks, Maria. Yeah, well, I think like the, sh the really short answer is my family. Um, hmm. It was the, the catalyst, but you know, to Mariah's point about what caused me to stop resisting the idea of writing a book. Um, when the Harper's piece came out, um, my agent asked me if I wanted to write a book. And I said, I, I don't think so. And she said, well, you know, think about it. Um, so I thought about it over a weekend and I realized that I did want to write the book, but only if I could do it in the way that I did it you know, so that there were these personal stories, but in each case, they were followed by these explorations of, you know, various things that touch ancestry that were interesting to me. So, you know, obviously genealogy, genetics, epigenetics, nature versus nurture, 
intergenerational trauma, generational wealth, you know, um, et cetera. So, um, you know, the, the hybrid nature of the book was what excited me. Hmm. Uh, you know, I, I was less interested in sort of staying locked in my own family. Thank you. And, and once again, Alexander, can I clone you or something to have you just come and help me with these programs all the time? The minute you mention something, Alexander's got the link in the chat. <laughs> so thank you for that. Oh, my goodness. I'm going to hand it back to the two of you to uh, see if you have any kind of final um, remarks or, or comments or anything you want to share. We've answered the audience questions and um, they were great questions. Thank you, audience. Anything else you'd like to add? They really were great questions. Um, I would like to encourage all of you to read Alex's work if you haven't. Um, that's my my primary note. Um, and um, you know, and also this is my book. And um, you know, I if you enjoyed the conversation, maybe you'd, you'd like to pick up a copy, but no pressure. Uh, no pressure. Absolutely. I'm, I'm pressuring. <laughs> pressure because you can support the Mark Twain house uh, if you buy the book. Yes. Um, yeah. Thank you for that. How about you, Alexander? Um, I just want to say congratulations, Maude. You've worked on this book for so long. I have. So hard. And I wish I was there to give you a big hug. Oh, I wish so too. I wish so too. Um, well, next next book launch, uh, you know, we'll have to do that. And I, you know, well, I do you, Alex, mm -hmm. and thank you everyone so much for for showing up for this. It's it's so nice to see all these names um, over in the sidebar, and so many names that I haven't even noticed are now flashing so uh, well you can come back and look at the chat again at your leisure like i said it, it'll be there um so you can you can uh, scroll through and um i just want to thank you both and i want to invite you both to come to hartford maybe together and tour the twain house again and um uh, we'd love to have you. So thank you, audience. And thank you, Maude and Alexander, for a fascinating evening. And folks, uh, the, we just reposted the link. If you were not already convinced that you need this book, I can't imagine that you're not convinced by now. So click the link and you get a signed copy and support the museum. So thank you very, very much. And good night, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Good, good night. night. Thank you. Bye-bye.